Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for sticking around. My name is Kelsey Moore. I'm a candidate in Film and Media Studies here at UCSB, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by Professor Shelley Stamp, who is Professor of Film and Digital Media at UC Santa Cruz. Welcome, Shelley. Thank you. Um, all right. <laughs> <laughs> So I just want to start off by thinking a little bit about the title, especially because, and this is kind of the first time I had tracked this, and I've seen this film many times, the film itself really starts with highlighting, you know, the lighting of multiple gas lamps. Um, so could you touch on the term gas lighting and how it relates to the overall themes of this film? Well, it's kind of amazing to think that the term gaslighting, which we use all the time now, actually comes from this film. Um, and I think that that opening is so evocative because of the gas lamps and the darkness and the fog, and it really starts to get us in the mindset of um, Paula's character. Right, and, and mm -hmm. the, f the, f the flickering light up and down, the flickering uncertainty, the fog, the darkness are all beautiful visual symbols for what we're gonna understand that she's going through. Um, and, and the other thing that, that really strikes me about that opening scene is that she doesn't speak. And she is told what to do and she's ordered around. She's told not to look back. She's told to ignore the, you know, ignore the past. And that sets up a lot, that sets a lot in motion. The next scene we see her with the singing teacher, same thing, men are speaking over her, telling her what to do. Um, so I think that, that opening sets up a lot for us, right? Um, yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, though this narrative is set in late 19th century London, Gaslight is actually MGM's 1944 adaptation of Patrick Hamilton's 1938 play, and it's also a remake of Thurl Dickinson's 1940 British film of the same name. So, Gaslight in its various iterations then may be thought of as a narrative that has quite literally persisted um, throughout the duration of World War II, and I bring this up because sort of thinking about these films as war films has been a running theme that we've had in the Carsey Wolf Center's um, big screen series. So could you speak a little bit about how this film fits into the broader repertoire of the time and how might we think of Gaslight as a war film? Yeah, I, I think that's a really fascinating question because I think there are, as you say, it's, it's not set in the US, let alone during the Second World War, but I think there's, there's a lot that we can think about the the context of this. So 11 million men are serving overseas. Hollywood's audience is predominantly women. It was, had been predominantly women in the 20s and 30s, but it's really predominantly women in the, during the war years. Um, so the industry's catering to women. Um, it is a period, at least on the West Coast, of uh, prescribed blackouts. So the darkness and the black is, would be familiar, at least to folks living uh, on the West Coast. Um, the, it, and, and of particular interest to me is the fact that it's released in 1944, um, which is a key year for film noir, right? Um, it, see if I can get this right, but Phantom Lady, Laura, Double Indemnity, Scarlet Street, Woman in the Window, all released in 1944 and sort of setting the temp key films of noir, right? Setting the template for noir, um, many of which feature female protagonists. Um, and so I think there's not only a kind of connection to the wartime context, for me there's a really interesting connection to, to noir and, and the links between the kind of gothic melodrama where we think of female audiences and noir where we don't necessarily think of female audiences. But again, the audience is predominantly female in 1944. The audiences that would have seen those early noirs also saw Gaslight and were also predominantly female, right? Um, and I think that there's aspects of the story of Gaslight that are familiar, would have been familiar to wartime audiences and would have resonated with noir. So, so sort of, wartime situations would have to do with the kind of 
family disruption um, that, that the story reveals, right? Um, um, uh, male family members who are uh, unexpectedly violent, right? Um, and, and then there's, there's real connections, I think, to noir in terms of the way the film emphasizes past trauma, the way the film, the, the darkness and angularity of the visual style, the, um, the way that the film emphasizes kind of extreme psychological states, anxiety, neurosis, panic, paranoia, all you know, familiar from noir. But I think there's an interesting reversal. If you think of this, this film, Double Indemnity, a really interesting reversal, right, in terms of um, uh, a, f a f female character in, in Double Indemnity, the Stanwyck character, Phyllis Dietrichson, who is predatory and violent mm -hmm. and, and whose home is full, filled with violence, whose marriage is, is filled with violence, um, and the kind of hapless dupe um, Walter Neff, and, and, but there's a gender reversal here in Gaslight. So, so to me, there's, there's really interesting resonances both in terms of the kind of wartime context, but then thinking about noir as emerging in the wartime too, mm -hmm. right? Uh, this is a, uh, an argument that the film historian Sherry Cheenan Beeson makes about noir. She says it's not a post-war phenomenon. It begins during the war. And I think we really see the connections here. Yeah, yeah, and so, because we're dealing with a moment that specifically caters to women as both, you know, Hollywood sort of producers and consumers, right? Um, and I know that archival work is an integral part of your own scholarly practice. So could you give us some insight as to how this film, you know, was or would have been marketed um, and what can contemporary audiences learn about those materials today? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you were kind enough to dig up a whole bunch of the marketing materials. Um, and I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's the, the marketing materials are so fascinating because very few people that saw Gaslight in 1944 are, are with us today. Mm -hmm. And so one way to, for us to think about how audiences would have been prepped to see this film um, is to look at promotional material. And there was a lot of great stuff that, that we saw in that mm -hmm. promotional material. I mean, for one thing, the, the trailer really, well, the trailer gives the whole film away. <laughs> no surprise. <laughs> but, but I think what's particularly interesting about the trailer is that it, the key scenes that are in the trailer are the scene um, at, towards the beginning of the film where Gregory crumples up the letter in the sort of this, his first fit of, of violence and anger. Mm -hmm. um, the scene where, towards the end, where Brian says, you're not mad, you've been systematically driven, made to think you're mad, or whatever he says to her, right? Uh, and then we get a love scene. We see a love scene between Gregory and Paula. So we already, in the trailer, so we already know. So that's, that's interesting from a kind of from the point of view of historical audiences because it helps us understand that anybody that saw the trailer would not be wondering so much what happens but how it happens mm -hmm. and would come in with a whole different set of questions. Mm -hmm. right? um, and the visual design of the, of the posters, I mean, you, you've, those, you've seen the, one of the key posters here, um, really does, some of the posters presented both a kind of potentially loving heterosexual couple with Charles Boyer and, and Ingrid Bergman, but then also a menacing figure, either Cotton and or Boyer in the background. So the heterosexual couple is always kind of menaced in the marketing material. So mm -hmm. there's a way that the marketing material is really prompting um, um, anxiety about heterosexual couples and, and, and um, a scrutiny of of heterosexual love and romance as, as false, mm -hmm. as, as having an undercurrent of danger and violence. Um, it's right there in the marketing material. Yeah. Um, and then the other weird thing that you found, but that I don't even know what to do with, is that <laughs> there was a, there's always a tie-in campaign, and right. there was a tie-in campaign suggested in Showman's Trade Review with gas utilities, and I don't know how you'd actually <laughs> make that work, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> yeah, I guess that gets us back to this idea of Gaslight as a wartime film in a way, right? Yeah, yeah. Like trying to show, because part of that advertisement was 
appealing to women about all the things they could have through these utilities in their post-war home. Yeah. Um, so that was really fascinating to me. I think the other point that was really interesting um, is the way that the materials sort of, they either present, you know, this melodrama yeah. or this thriller, right? right? And sometimes those words are put together mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. different posters mm -hmm. and these mm -hmm. lobby cards, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we think about this relationship between melodrama and thrill, is this what really kind of situates this film in this gothic romance genre? And for those who aren't familiar, could you just provide some brief context as to what we mean by that? Yes, and, and, and I would preface that by saying, too, that, that all the noir titles I just mentioned, all mm -hmm. the 44 noir titles and into 45 and 46. Of course, film noir is not a term that's used in the 40s. It, right. it comes much later. Um, and so the, the, the marketing and reviews of the titles we now think of as noir are also doing the same thing. They call them crime melodramas. They call them um, crime thrillers. They call them melodramatic, the same language, mm -hmm. right? And so again, there's this bridge, I think, between the gothic melodrama and what we think of now as noir. It, it wasn't as, I think we tend to maybe think of those two things as quite separate mm -hmm. now, uh, and, and we tend to assign a gendered audience to them in a way that I don't think is accurate for the 40s, right? We think of gothic melodrama as a, as a woman, part of the woman's picture and noir as a, as a guy genre, and I don't think that's really true. Not a genre, cycle. Um, but so gothic melodrama predates film, of course, mm -hmm. long tradition in, in literature, but in the 40s, it's, it's a very rich strain of the woman's picture, right? This, um, uh, this uh, subset of the woman's picture where there is a kind of um, menace in the home, uh, particularly a menace in a heterosexual marriage, and the home is not a safe place, the home is a dangerous place. And so if we think about um, Rebecca of 1940, or um, Suspicion of 41, um, and then this gas that comes in 44, and then um, uh, Enchanted Cottage in 45. Um, Sorry, Wrong Number isn't a film until 48, mm -hmm. but it's a very well-known radio play that's redone and rebroadcast throughout 30, 43 is when it's first broadcast at 44. So that would have been um, uh, in the air. I, I can't help, of course, but think of Shadow of a Doubt as well. It's not exactly a gothic melodrama, but it's another example of a, of a film where a, a, a male family member, in that case, Uncle Charlie, um, is, is dangerous and violent and menacing, and the home isn't a safe space mm -hmm. at all. Um, and so Gaslight is part of that real flowering of the gothic melodrama yeah. um, in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, this particular version has many contrasts from its predecessors, um, and these differences include its opening. So in Dickinson's version, we watch the aunt's murder occur on screen, and we only turn to her niece as she makes her later return to Thornton Square, which we do have here, but much later. In Kukor's film, we don't see the death of her aunt. Instead, we remain outside, and we watch her departure from the house as though we're one of those kind of neighborhood onlookers. Mm -hmm. And then we also see the house as gaslights for the first time, as we chatted about at the beginning. Um, could you speak a little bit about this opening and how it sets up the film's relationship to notions of presence, absence, and especially spectatorship? Because we're always, mm -hmm, there's mm -hmm. this, you know, theme of watching mm -hmm, throughout mm -hmm. the whole film. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it really, like, just building on what I was saying before about how it, um, it, 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 it introduces this idea of, um, Paula being spoken over and spoken to and not having her own voice or her own thoughts. I think it, it also prompts in us a, a kind of curiosity, right? What has happened in that house? Mm -hmm. um, why, can't, why shouldn't she look back? What is there that she shouldn't remember? Right, um, and so it's setting up, so it's, there's an interesting contrast, I think, between this kind of mute, controlled, woman on screen and an audience that is really prompted to immediately to ask questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, as we were saying, if, you've, if they've seen the trailer, then they have even more questions, right? right. Um, not less, but more probably if they've seen the trailer. So I, I think it's, it's very, it's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So we're almost prompted to meddle 
and yeah. question what's in the house, right? right? right so right. we also see these kind of meddlesome components in a character like Miss Thwaites, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> especially when we compare her to the other female characters. Mm -hmm. We have the mm -hmm. housemaids, Elizabeth and Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, what are we to make of Miss Thwaites and her kind of recurring presence, right? Mm -hmm. We follow mm -hmm. her all the way to the end. Yeah. And how does her female curiosity I think differ from that of our kind of male detective figure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Brian Cameron. Yeah, uh, uh, bloodthirsty Bessie, yeah. right, as she's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, she's she's absolutely crucial, right? Because when we meet her, um, she's she's reading a kind of Bluebeard-like story on the train, and she's going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And so she's clearly a surrogate for us, right? She's, she's enjoying a fictional story about uh, a murderous man um, and an endangered, I was gonna say an endangered wife, m multiple endangered wives in that case. Um, and, and so she's, she's very clearly a surrogate for us, mm -hmm. right? She's sort of made fun of, um, bloodthirsty Bessie, and she's this meddlesome neighbor, but she's clearly a surrogate for us in her curiosity and her, her love of bloodthirsty mis murder mystery tales, right? Um, and then I think Elizabeth and Nancy are also a kind of surrogates for us, too. And they're, they're suspicious of what's going on in the house, Nancy more so than Elizabeth. But even Elizabeth says to Nancy early on, he keeps telling her she's sick, but I'm not sure she is. And then Nancy really pushes. Like, she says, why can't we go up there? What's upstairs? Uh, she doesn't look sick to me. Um, and so those three women, I think, are very clear on-screen surrogates for audience members, female audience members in particular, right, who bring a kind of curiosity to this story. Um, and I think it's really important that those three diegetic surrogates really appear and start questioning things long before Brian shows up, right? And so that curiosity is really important, and I think it's a good... It's an interesting balance with Paula, because as much as we are invited to, to empathize with Paula and to share her, her experience in many, many ways, right, we are also invited to recognize that kind of curiosity and love of murder mysteries that, that these other women have. So it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So unlike Miss Thwaites, and especially Elizabeth, right, because she does seem to be the most protective of the two housemaids. Yeah. I um, mean, she's suspicious. Nancy, which, um, you know, this is notably Angela Lansbury's film debut and her first Academy Award nomination, which is great. Um, but she's predominantly defined by her promiscuous ways. Mm -hmm. And so why do you think the film provides us with these, you know, key yet contrasting female archetypes? Like, what are, what are the different functions of having this kind of promiscuous curiosity. I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting because if you if thinking about um, Miss Sweet and then um, Nancy, neither of them are particularly likable, right? I mean, as we talked about, Miss Sweet, she sort of meddles, she steals the strawberry. I heard everybody respond <laughs> to that. Like, that, that's really, she's really crossing, that stealing of the strawberry yeah. really crosses a line. And it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a sign for us that she's a little bit, it's a little much. What she's, she's pushing a little too much and she's intruding her hand in the story. She's intruding a little too much. So she's not particularly likable. And Nancy, again, is, um, has a kind of, of sexual promiscuity. And, and um, not just that, but, but the kind of open flirtation with Gregory that is, um, is that the film, I think, is judging, right? I, asking us to judge in a negative way. And so they're not, they're not entirely sympathetic characters, um, but I still think they're important as these kind of diegetic surrogates and, and kind of anchors for us um, as, as people who, who, who suspect that something's wrong, right? They, they, they don't, don't, can't quite put their finger on it, but they suspect that something's wrong, and that's an important anchor for us. And, and I would even add Lady Dalroy, is that her name? Um, she, even she suspects a little something to, to the point where she's willing to sit Brian next to, to Paula at the dinner. Um, she wants to know who this Mr. Anton is. She's, she's curious too, right? So all, lots of the female characters, all the other female characters really, are, are curious in a kind of, curious, almost concerned, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 and we come to see that as a good thing. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Nancy's flirtatious demeanor ultimately reveals yet another facet of Gregory's manipulations, right? Because yeah. there's clearly, clearly some attraction, flirtation going on between mm -hmm. the two. Mm -hmm. um, can you speak a little bit about Gregory's character and his strategic reliance on varying modes of affection? Mm -hmm. um, how does his duplicity compare to other sort of husband figures, you know, from these other gothic romances mm -hmm. or, or noir films that mm -hmm. you've mentioned? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Part of me wants to say they're all of a piece. They're all so awful. But what, what's interesting about this one, I think, is that we're really, um, we're, we're really, in, the audience is really invited to scrutinize him from the beginning. We're never really duped by him, right? Like that opening, the scene when they, when she leaves her, her singing lesson and they, they, we understand them to be a couple and they kiss and, the, um, that's all framed, you know, in with the, that kind of um, metal fence behind them um, that casts these this web of shadows, spider-like web of shadows, mm -hmm. onto them. And then when she leaves, and we see him at the end, he's framed. He's shot through that fence, so he's literally imprisoned. So, and she says, "I don't know you." Um, so from the beginning, right? We're we're encouraged to to scrutinize his affection, mm -hmm. right? And then as the film progresses, there are other compositions where we are allowed to see two shots with, where they're both in the frame, where we're allowed to see his reaction that she doesn't see because of the blocking, right? We, we see a response on his face that she doesn't see because she's turned away. And we can see that she doesn't see, right? We see right. and we can see that she doesn't see. So, you know, like when he sees her portrait, the aunt's portrait for the first time, or um, the, uh, the letter, when she's reading the letter for the first time. So there's all sorts of ways in which I think even if an audience hasn't seen the trailer, <laughs> um, the film sets up a kind of suspicion always about about his affection. I think I think it's always mm -hmm. um, in question, right? Yeah, and I think we even get you know at the beginning when they're at the Tower of London and he's yeah. reading about the jewels, and you can tell that he's he's no longer reading. He's just kind of doing this from memory, and you see him kind of go into this daze that we then get later where he's actually the one who's kind of in this obsessive yeah. imaginary state, which yeah. is a very, a very interesting um, contrast to what he's trying to do right. to Paula. Right. Um, now, when we think about Paula and Ingrid Bergman's portrayal of her, which this performance earned Bergman her first um, Best Actress Academy Award win, um, can we think a little bit just about Bergman's performance and how she kind of um, facilitates Paula's gradual undoing? Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting because um, I, I am always unsure in that final scene, and there's lots to say about the final scene, but I'm, I'm always unsure in the final scene whether she is, whether the character is performing madness or whether the character has descended into madness. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think is a testament to Bergman's performance, right? Because we, th th there's been this kind of gradual unraveling and a descent that, that Bergman has so carefully kind of laid out for us. And then by the end, the levels of, of that she brings to that moment when we're not really sure whether, where she is on that spectrum is I think just absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, and I think too that, that I mean, the other thing that I think is, is, is interesting, and maybe this isn't quite about performance, but her, so much of, so many women's pictures, so many gothic melodramas are about um, 
giving the audience access to the subjective experience of the female protagonist, right, through flashbacks or um, <clears throat> memories or optical point of view. And, and we get that with Bergman, right? We get her um, optical point of view when she re-enters the house for the first time. We get that kind of, I don't know if it's a, it's a, some kind of warped aural memory that she has of him telling her mm -hmm. her mother was meant, right? So there's ways in which we are um, in her mind um, and other points when, when it's, we're very clearly not, um, where we're watching her, right? Um, and and that, that's, again, that plays into, I think, that sort of curiosity that mm -hmm. we were talking about before and the way that we're, not only are we scrutinizing Gregory, I think we're also scrutinizing her. How far has she, is, is he, is, is his campaign, is his gaslighting campaign winning? Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and I think that Bergman's performance is so subtle in keeping us unsure of where she is that, that yeah. Yeah, I think, and this gets us to what Diane Waldman and others have discussed about the kind of central component of the Gothic romance, which mm -hmm. is this ambiguity, mm -hmm. or Waldman calls it hesitation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, particularly around the validation of the feminine experience. Mm -hmm. So are there other ways that you think the film plays with that, with Paula's subjectivity, as well as the viewers? Um, we have you know, many different visual and oral elements at work here. And I also mm -hmm. think the house mm -hmm. is it's, you know, a character yeah. in itself. And we could consider claustrophobia yeah. as a sort of, I don't know, yeah. subjective undoing yeah. for the viewer. Yeah, and I think, I think that there's, the, the film really plays with giving us, give, providing information and withholding information. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that I think we understand to be real, like the noises from above and the gaslight flickering. There's other things that are, that are left unexplained for a long time, like the disappearing cameo and the disappearing watch and the misplaced picture from the wall. We don't, that information is withheld from us. Mm -hmm. So there is a real uncertainty on our part, I think, about exactly what is going on and whether or not she has done those things or not, right? Um, until, I think that changes with um, the letter. Um, when he, when he tells her that, that there was no letter, right? Mm -hmm. Because we've seen the letter. Um, and when he tells her there's no letter and, that, and then goes on to tell her that her mother was, I think that's a breaking point in terms of our understanding of, mm -hmm. of what's going mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that when we get to the attic scene, mm -hmm. right, it's really up to us and her to decide whether she can decipher between yeah. all that happened or did not happen, as yeah. Gregory tells her, right? Um, and so I wonder if, does, do you think that that particular scene provides us with anything that the previous moment where she really, you know, she unleashes and she's like screaming for Elizabeth and mm -hmm, she really mm -hmm. kind of feels like she's going mad. Are, are those two scenes different or do you see them as a continuation of the character? That, that's a great question. I, I think I want to say that they're different because I think that the moment when she's screaming for Elizabeth at the top of the stairs is kind of her lowest point. Um, she's completely out of control. Mm -hmm. and, but there is a sense in that attic scene. I'm, you know, she and Brian have um, put things together. Um, she she is, is asserting a kind of control. Again, you know, like I was saying a minute ago, it's not entirely, there's a little bit of uncertainty, I think, on our part about is she feigning madness or is she just playing into him? But I think there's enough of a sense that she has, uh, she has reasserted some sort of control. Might not have a full grasp on reality, but has reasserted some sort of control. And we come to understand, as you said a minute ago, that it's actually him mm -hmm. who is mentally ill. 
not her. Um, so there, I think there is a real difference between that moment of screaming at the top of the stairs and, mm -hmm. and the final mm -hmm. um, confrontation. Yeah, do you think that there are key differences too between, because, let me back up, because we watch some things happen and we hear about some things, right? Mm -hmm. So you're never sure, like mm -hmm. you said, mm -hmm. what she's doing or what she's not doing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that really relies on how the film plays with time. Mm -hmm. And so does, do you find that the film uses time and space differently if we do think of the house as, as its own character? Because mm. a lot of it has to do with memory and you know forgetting the past, but also looking towards the future, as Gregory said, like making the house something you know, that's worth their, their newfound future together. I also find it so interesting because I, I've read that, you know, Ingrid Bergman actually um, researched a bit in an asylum for this role, particularly mm -hmm. women who had mm -hmm. signs of dementia. Mm -hmm. And so I think this connection between time and memory is really, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. really crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting to think about that. I mean, I, I think that the, I mean, when I think about the house too, I think of it also as a, a kind of a material symbol for the weight of, of trauma mm -hmm. and repressed memory, if you think about that, you know, the attic that's full of, <laughs> jam full of stuff, right? Um, and that's, that's closed off, but leaking sound. I mean, it, it's such a, such an evocative um, visual symbol for, for the kind of the weight of, of repressed trauma, um, which is, and so in that sense, I think the film is the, and again, like noir, I think the film is playing with time in the sense of um, it's, it's insisting that that past trauma, particularly repressed trauma, is going to return. Mm. It's there. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. going to return. Mm -hmm. It's going to come out of the past to get you. Yeah. And you can't hide from it. it. It doesn't do any good to, to, to not to look back. Two characters tell her, don't look back. Mm -hmm. um, so that, in that sense, there's a kind of playing with time, too, having to do with, with, um, with trauma yeah. and, and repression. Yeah, certainly. And I think time gets us to thinking through this film's legacy, mm. right? So mm -hmm. not only are we very aware that like gaslighting itself has become such a buzzword, but these conversations did not start with this film and they're certainly ongoing. So could we think just a bit about how this film fits into this much larger trajectory mm -hmm. of sexual mm -hmm. abuse and gender mm -hmm. inequity mm -hmm. throughout Hollywood and, mm -hmm. and Me Too and even beyond mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, first of all, I think this, this film is reminding us of the violence that lurks behind gaslighting, mm -hmm. right? Gaslighting that we all, many of us experience um, all the time. And so it's really, it's so great that this is the film that, <laughs> where, that the term comes from because it's not just because there's gas lights in the film, it's because there's violence that's lurking behind this kind of um, refusal to acknowledge women's reality. Mm. Um, so there's that. And, and I think, it's also interesting because so much of the contemporary conversations around Me Too have been driven by women in the entertainment industry, um, women in the entertainment industry who came forward. Um, and not, not entirely, but, but a lot of the conversation has been um, spearheaded and, and women in the entertainment industry really um, um, made very bold moves to go public with their experiences. And, um, but as a historian, <laughs> I have to say that I have, I have done a fair amount of research on early Hollywood and 
the earliest instance I found of a quote unquote casting couch story, fears about the casting couch, is 1913. So this story, which became a kind of joke right around the casting couch, um, these fears about sexual harassment, sexual abuse, sexual assault in the entertainment industry and, and the gaslighting that followed um, have been around for, you know, since the industry coalesced here mm -hmm. in 1913. So, um, yeah, there's a, the long, a, a long legacy. Yeah, and I, I think it's so interesting too that Bergman wins her first Academy Award for this, right? And then you and I talked about her appearance in the 1965? Yes, 1969. 69. Yes. yes. Yeah, can you just share a little bit yes. about that? Yes, yes, thank you for reminding me about that. Yes, so Academy Award ceremony in 1969, um, Bergman and four other actresses present the Academy Award for I believe it's Best Director. And let me see if I can get this right. It's Rosalind Russell, Bergman, Diane Carroll, Jane Fonda, and Natalie Wood, I think. That's who it is, right? And they, uh, they're, so they're jointly, the five different generations of actresses are um, presenting the award for Best Director, and they don't read the script. They um, make, uh, they, they say, um, these, uh, these films do not have adequate roles for women. Um, there are not um, female characters uh, for us to play. And that's 1969. That's 1969. That was a long time ago, right? Um, so they're not talking about sexual uh, harassment, sexual abuse, sexual assault, but they're talking about the other piece of this, mm -hmm. right, which is um, creative control in Hollywood and... Um, the, the continuing fight for um, roles for women, right? right. Um, and the, the 1940s was a, a extraordinary time for, for roles for women mm -hmm. and films driven by um, female characters. Right, and we clearly don't, I mean, we really don't get that appearance, right, at the Oscars without this film, so. Yeah. That's right, really right, That's exactly, really great, exactly. Yeah. It, it, I think the, the fact that, it, that Rosalind Russell and Bergman mm -hmm. um, are part of that group of five, that multi-generational group of five, right. tells you a lot. Great, thank you Thank you. Thanks for sticking with us. <laughs>